opposite of this. Unmediated. It's um, it's unmediated. It's immoderate. It's unconstrained, and that's kind of gets the closest to the notion of evil to me. When you have unconstrained, concentrated power, then you're just off the rails completely about any notion of of humanity, a la Putin, uh, etc. So. <clears throat> So why we all end up with different um, versions of that in us uh, is, I think, just the vagaries of genes and upbringing and how we're raised and the community we grew up in. All that stuff is different for everybody. And and so we all have a little bit of the, the good and the bad in us, a little bit of the children of light, children of darkness in all of us, um, which is an uncomfortable notion, but I think it's honest, the honest Truth. And then um, just a little bit on why I think power is such an issue. And to me, it gets back to our mortality, quite simply. That is, um, we seek power principally to deny this one fact of our existence that is frightening to everybody, which is we're going to die. Um, it's sort of this meta or foundational reality, this contradictory dyad, life versus death. Um, and so the normal human impulse is to, to of course, um, face, uh, face this or more commonly to deny it altogether, consciously or otherwise, even though everybody intellectually would say, of course, I know I'm going to die. We act as if we're not going to die or we want to we want to ward off death. Um, death always wins. Um, and uh, and life always kind of fights against that reality. So I think that death and our fear of it has a deep rooted and very complex power over much of human history and of consciousness in general. Hmm. Uh, and again, there can be darkness and light, but the more we are unconsciously even denying a death as the issue, the more it gets to the dark side. Um, so um so really we is where the power goes is it's kind of a will to dominance that underlies much of our woes as humanity so so to me the will to power or the desire for control is driven by the fear of our own fragility and our mortality uh if we can feel powerful and in control we can effectively deny that fragility mm -hmm. and i've got to read you a little thing by, uh, see if I can pronounce this right, Jose Ortega y Gasset, famous Spanish writer, philosopher. He's go, he says this, for life is at the start a chaos and which one is lost. The individual suspects this, but he is frightened at finding himself face to face with this terrible reality and tries to cover it up with a curtain of fantasy where everything is clear. It does not worry him that his, quote, ideas are not true. He uses them as trenches for the defense of his existence, as scarecrows to frighten away reality. So that's kind of a dark thing. And then one other thing, a little bit more hopefully, um, by, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, uh, Charles Handy. He wrote a book called The Age of Paradox I have right here in my desk. Um, and he's acknowledges the same thing, the contradiction, but in a little bit, he says it's not all hopeless, basically. So he says, paradox, which, and I'm saying life and death is the big paradox, confuses us because it asks us to live with simultaneous opposites. To live with simultaneous opposites is at first glance a recipe for indecision at best, schizophrenia at worst. It need not be. When we are used to it and understand and understand paradox is no bother. It is, however, the understanding that is the key. Balancing the opposites or switching between them must not be a random or haphazard act. And he says, living with paradox is like riding a seesaw. Um, if you know the process works, and if the person on the other end also knows, then the ride can be exhilarating. If, however, your opposite number does not understand, or willfully upsets that pattern, 
you can receive a very uncomfortable and unexpected shock. We can even come to realize that for the seesaw to work effectively, others must get as good as we get. Um, so there's a little bit of, a little bit of hope in that from uh, Gerald's handy. So um, so that's kind of the core of it to me, and most of where we go with how we organize our society and and getting to democracy is um, heavily influenced by that kind of ultimate reality that is uh, affects us. Um, so just to get to democracy, so power is really the central problem, I believe, for our for democracy and certainly our species. We're driven to seek power because of the fear of death, I believe. Um, and the people who will seek concentrated power are never going to cease or disappear. It's too fundamental. We can't, we're never going to get rid of it. Um, but I believe that the power of freedom and collective self-determination actually rises up whenever there's concentrated power. It's almost like um, concentrated power and uh, the bad kind especially feeds freedom because it, it um, causes a reaction against that uh, power, that domination, power as domination, when that exists, it's a, a way it can crush people, but can also feed a desire for freedom and self-determination. So when we can diminish domination and power, we can um, enhance, of course, self-determination, community, democracy. Um, but the problem is, again, there's no simple answer. And so gets back to the seesaw, I think we need to kind of accept that freedom has to be defended and nurtured ongoingly and really relentlessly because um, these things like isolation, fear, resentment, grievance, just the raw seductive allure of power, divisions of nationalism, populism, and taking democracy for granted, all of these are the lifeblood of those seeking concentrated power. So there we are. We need continual vigilance, struggle, resistance, um, and it's never going to end. You know, just like the trying to make democracy better rather than worse is never going to end. It's the same with this this more fundamental issue. And of course, we see this all over the world in every era of Ukraine, an obvious example uh, today. So. Um, so that's kind of the basics. I'll stop there. Any any thoughts or questions? I wanted to get into a little bit more into democracy itself and citizenship next, but any other thoughts? You know, David, as you're talking, I'm thinking about one element of power that, uh, that I think might contribute as well, and that's uh, one's ideology, wherever that comes from. Um, <clears throat> that becomes really powerful because if you've got a strong ideology and a sense of what needs to happen and you're really not listening to anybody, um, that I think is also part of what we're, we're facing right now. Right. Right. That ideology, uh, uh, the MAGA ideology is really unbelievable. Um, and they've hijacked really the, uh, the idea of a lot of principles like um, freedom, for example. Uh, one MAGA congressman I know was telling me that he doesn't think electric cars uh, are a good idea because it hampers his freedom to drive the whole length of the state of Virginia. <laughs> he can't, and that, um, that, that principle of his freedom to, to not be able to do that. Because That's creative. Uh, yeah, I was shocked. It's also very false. Uh, very, so, yeah, it happens to be false too. <laughs> but in other words, he, his ideology is one of this false sense of freedom, and he ignores everything else, the environment. Well, that's a great point. That ideology is something that we kind of, it's a scaffolding that we build to, to uh, feel more powerful and to feel like we have agency and to feel like we're in the right. And so we have um, this on both sides. And there was a recent survey that something like 75%, I think, of Americans think that the threat to democracy is going on right now. That sounds great at first blush, but then you realize that it's that high a percentage because 
there's these two camps who both think they're defending democracy, who both think they're speaking for freedom. Exactly. And I think where it gets even more dangerous is when you overlay religion on top of that ideology. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just another ideology. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> Finn is there's a frontline documentary I just watched. I'm actually going to watch it again. And General Flynn is talking about God has spoken to him and oh, God has told him the election was stolen. And, wow. and he's, you know, here's a U.S. general saying something like this. It's such uh, a crazy. But to your point, it, it's sort of about mortality. If, in fact, you're listening and God is talking to you this way and you think you're going to die at some point, uh, you're you're faced with a decision. Am I going to listen to this voice of God because I really want to go to heaven after it's all over? Or am I going to listen to, you know, the Democrats or whoever else you're you're going to listen to? So I think um, that consciousness that you're yeah. pointing out about the fear of death, it, it's yeah. got a lot of elements to it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. I, um, and just to, to move on, I guess the the. Um, when I think about why do we care about democracy, to me, it, one the simplest way to express it is it is about citizenship. Because if you think about at least what I think of as citizenship means, it means uh, community, it means caring about others, it means um, exercising your responsibility as a, as a member of a society or community. That's, um, that's citizenship in my mind. And so that's a becomes kind of a foundation for the scaffolding and infrastructure of democracy. Um, so I think that's, um, and I can, I'll go on a little bit, I guess, to, to another set of connections about citizenship. So a lot of these things, by the way, are from things I've already written on nurture democracy posts, but it's stuff I've been thinking about a lot. So it's just, uh, it made it easier to prepare. To <laughs> so, so there's a series of linkages that I want to make here. There's uh, four of them. So the way I see it, um, political democracy comes from or derives from democratic citizenship. So that's a particular kind of citizenship. And um, the way uh, this guy, John Hallowell, um, puts it, who wrote this book in 1956, I think, about the moral foundation of democracy. He says, real consent as a positive force arising out of inner conviction is a positive force. It is not synony synonymous with passive acquiescence. <clears throat> it is found as the basis of government, where there is a community of values and interests, where there is positive affirmation of certain fundamental values common to the large majority of individuals and groups within the nation. So that's part one. But then you say, where does democratic citizenship come from? It comes from citizenship itself. So it's where the community and the notion of caring about others in a sort of neighborhood way or a family way begins to transform into democratic citizenship where you're, you're moving down the road to a political democracy. And then <clears throat> citizenship itself, I think, comes from the notion mm -hmm. of freedom. You know, again, if we can get rid of the, our fear of death, we can think about there's a there's a very uh, freedom as a very powerful notion. And if we want to be uh, free, one of the best ways to make that happen is to be um, is uh, citizenship. That is to say, it's not freedom. Freedom to me isn't about just being off by yourself in the wilderness. So that's a kind of freedom, I guess. But really, it's about um, uh, protecting your own freedom by being part of a group, which is necessary in the end of the day to counter the bad kind of concentrated power. So you go from political democracy to freedom. Um, well, I'll go even farther. I forgot about this. So freedom. Um, goes back to wanting to be authentic and wanting to survive. You know, if you go really basic, you want you, know, you want freedom so that you can keep a roof over your head so you have enough food to eat, 
so you you don't die. Uh, again, you're that's a positive side. So we want um, to be able to clothe ourselves and have shelter and food. And and once those things get a little bit secure, then we think more about authenticity and the real search for meaning that is kind of intrinsic human agency. Once you have a feeling of agency based on getting your basic needs met, then you realize, wait, freedom is necessary to maintain that. If I if I lose my freedom, then I'm gonna lose these things, including the really basic things. I could lose a roof over my head. I could lose my children because Russia sent them to Russia, back to Russia to be adopted, uh, et cetera. So it's pretty basic uh, foundational stuff when you talk about trying to make democracy work. Um, so in my last part is really just about, a lot of it is about this guy, John Halliwell, and I ran across his book uh, five or six years ago, I think, um, um, Moral Foundations of Democracy. And he he writes um, in very clear ways, because again, he's, he's focused on something that happened so recently. So here's an example. I can show them if you ask me That's, that. I, I triggered Siri just then for some reason. <laughs> <Came on. laughs> so so um, he says, uh, fascism is the practical manifestation of the repudiation of the reason in the realm of politics. The fascist scheme of things is an expression of human will, which creates its own truths and values from day to day to suit its changing purposes. That's the sort of alternative facts stuff uh, mm. coming out. Um, so he he goes into all kinds of stuff about classical realism. And then if we don't have, which is basically a belief in reason, if we don't have reason, if we don't have a way of figuring out, looking at something that's going on and figuring out what it means and what's really going on, what the truth is we're using reason, then we're nowhere. If we can't do that, we have no common ground and we're not gonna be able to solve things. And that's of course the fear that a lot of us have about what's happening today, you know, that we're kind of losing this, um, we're losing a shared uh, set of facts and a shared sense of reason. But he goes on and on. It's a very small book, but very um, worth taking a look at. It's, um, I don't have it here. Anyway, I was gonna show you how thin it was. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite thin um and and he goes back all the way to the middle ages and plato and aristotle and he talks as i've been talking about with greek democracy how this has been going on for a really long time there's this there's this struggle um between um uh, in a way reason and anti-reason and that goes back again in my mind to why there's that struggle well it goes back to people latching onto things that they think is going to help them um, assuage their fear of death, ultimately. Uh, and there's a there's another guy, uh, Ernest Becker, who wrote a book called, um, uh, which is basically the book I wanted to write, but he beat me to it by about 50 <laughs> years. It's called uh, The Denial of Death. He's And he writes it partly from a more of a psychologist, psychiatric perspective, but he's I think he might be a psychiatrist, or was, but um, it's a little more dense than Hallowell's work, but also really worth reading um, if you have nothing else to do. You know, it's really <laughs> <laughs> which I don't know about you guys, but that's my problem: is uh, how to how to uh, really fit in what I want to read. I just never get. Oh, it's awful! Yeah, I, and I'm. It's like a losing battle. I don't know. It's like the more. As my life goes on, even when I'm reading a lot, I might read two books, but I know I learn about four. And I read three books, I learn about six. And you know, just gets like... <laughs> so um, so that's that's kind of it for the moment. So um, well, I just want to say what what Hallowell talks about again. I don't want to, I got a whole bunch of quotes that are great from him that I don't want to get into, I don't think, but um, but he, uh, 
directly when he talks about fascism, what happened in World War II, he di it's directly applicable to today in almost every way. Um, but it goes back to the Greeks, you know, they, uh, it kept happening over and over again. They developed this amazing democracy in Athens, not in other Greek city states, interestingly, just in Athens. Um, and over and over again, guess what? It was threatened by concentrated power, the problem of domination, uh, the other things that I think are expressed, fear of death, hubris, fear, greed, will to power, all of that conspired, repeatedly threatened democracy. They um, spent hundreds of years trying to work out that problem and ultimately democracy was crushed anyway at the end of the day. Um, but it was really in evidence in Greece for about 600 years. Mm. Uh, if you look back at that period of time, it's pretty remarkable. And the, and the legacy of what they did in that 600 year period is the foundation of the democ democracy that we have today. Mm. But democracy itself was lost completely for what, 1500, 2000 years, utterly gone, nowhere existing on the planet. Yeah. So um, if you want to really worry, you could say, well, it happened before. Could it happen again? Could we lose it completely? And history says maybe, but hopefully it, it has a little more traction now than it had in the Greek era, which, you know, there were something like 150 Greek city states, many of them small, but still only Athens developed democracy and none of the other city states latched onto the idea, even though they could see that it made Athens more powerful, more, um, more uh, uh, empowered in a good way as a group of people. They could see that happening, but there was constant war and maybe they just said, oh, they're just trying to overtake us, which they kind of were. Uh, we're not going to go that democracy route. They just didn't. And if more people, if more city states had adopted it, it might not have been possible to crush it relatively easily at the end by Philip of Macedonia is the guy who made it happen. He didn't realize how uh, long lasting his, uh, his conquest of Athens was really going to be. Mm. So. Interesting. David, I'm wondering if we can take a little step back. I'm very interested in why you got interested in this subject. Mm -hmm. What led you to do all this work? Because it's really uh, interesting. I don't, you know, it's a great question, Suzanne. I think um, I'm trying to think of any of there was any bit of this. I think it probably started in college a little bit. I don't think before that. There wasn't a particularly, you know, my parents were kind of classic liberal Democrats, but not activists or anything. And no, there wasn't talk about democracy around my house growing up. But I think in, in college, I began to broaden my um, perspective, mostly to do with history, not so much democracy. I read, I read a lot of history in college. I probably should have majored in it, but anyway, I, that was some of the most interesting work I did in college. And that just sort of put a few seeds down, I guess. And then I was going to BC where I really had the, um, the time or the support or the seeds were ready to, to come out a little or something, all the above, that I got very interested in this around <coughs> workplace democracy stuff and, and all of that. So, um, but, I also got into the broader notion of philosophy of, of history and, uh, and the history of democracy and all of that. And I just haven't been able to let it go after all this time. I've continued to think about it and do a modest amount of writing and collect again, more books than I can read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it just is, uh, and this current thing of my Nurtured Democracy website is been tremendous fun for me um and i'm motivated to do it because i get satisfaction out of it and then the added thing of i get i get notes kind of out of the blue from people i haven't talked to about this at all in person or or i haven't talked to about anything for years sometimes decades where somebody gets this and they write me a note and they say thank you for doing this yeah. i mean that sort of gives me more motivation to make sure i keep going 
but the but I get so much satisfaction of doing it myself that um, so that I'm that's what got me drilling into. I was writing initially on the website about the, the issue of power more broadly, et cetera, but then decided to do this whole series on the development of democracy in Greece and mm -hmm. delved into that in detail. And there's it's there's remarkable amount of information available on what happened that far back. It's mostly because of Aristotle and Plato and uh, Th Thucydides, I think you say, the, a, a Greek historian who wrote down a lot of stuff in detail about democracy and somehow that was, wasn't lost. And they are probably the reason why democracy exists. Maybe if there's a few others, probably six or seven Greek uh, writers managed to write enough stuff down that it, and it's, it, again, didn't all get destroyed somehow. So um, that's been, been a process of distillation. So I'm trying to make the, the, um, the uh, post short and uh, easy to read. Yeah, no, but, it's great. You know, I'll, I'll do like one little post and it's really the distillation of like 150 pages of stuff <laughs> from different sources. <laughs> but it's a it's kind of interesting challenge to do that. How much and how often I have to put in more detail and not put in more detail is I'm constantly kind of playing with that. Yeah. Oh, I, oh go ahead. Well, I'm diving into one little aspect of it, but so when you, uh, one thing that struck me was, I think you said in there that, uh, so Greece had an empire. Yeah. And I think because of that empire, they didn't have to tax the citizens to pay for their civil service. Did right. I get that? Okay. Right. Yeah. And so, and obviously, okay, I, I guess I don't remember reading much about the empire and how democratic or non-democratic they were. I mean, I assume they're not democratic at all. It's just right. the democracy is the citizens of Athens, the landholders, the whatever. But, yeah, that's right. I mean, Athens, Ath and it became this, um, this, you could say, virtuous cycle or not so virtuous or both really so when they developed democracy what got unlocked was this notion of uh, making decisions as a uh, together as as citizens and the, the uh, oligarchs and the aristocracy lost a lot of power and they realized that the country became city-state became more of a um agile and um grouping that could um they could make decisions more quickly. And when they made a decision, it was highly supported. So all of that gave highly supported. More... How would it be more quickly? You know, I would think that Sparta would be able to make the decisions quickly because. Well, no, actually, it would seem that way. But Sparta was actually slower to make decisions because they had a more narrow and kind of a rigid notion of they really had no notion of individual agency or property at all. They were all about the community. Right. But in a really rigid way. So they actually were known throughout the Greek world as being great fighters, because that's all they trained to do, uh, not thinkers, not anything <clears> else. <throat> and uh, but they were also known as being uh, uh, having not much imagination. So so what happened, you, you kind of had democracy became sort of an entrepreneurial force in uh, back in ancient Greece. And they realized that it they could get more adherence from the citizens and non-citizens alike, they could, they could, um, and that created the ability to build bigger navies and bigger ships. And mm -hmm. when they built their empire across the Aegean, just sort of on the edges of it, because they would run into, on one side, they ran into um, um, the, I'll get to that, uh, but they- <laughs> Another they big empire. They didn't, um, they didn't supply, uh, they didn't uh, spread democracy itself. They kept democracy for themselves, you could say. And they were also, and this is where there's a lot of contradictions, they were also basically imperialist. I mean, they, Pericles, one of the most famous ex, uh, proponents of democracy, was this huge imperialist, and they wanted territory, and they wanted to conquer other countries. They wanted to be, they had 
are almost in continuous war, sometimes good, sometimes bad for them. But, but that's how their uh, empire got created and it made them very, very wealthy. And they created what we now know as this golden era of the era of Greece, where the all the statues that we know in the Parthenon and all that stuff right. was uh, was because of the wealth that was created. Uh, it appears to be in large measure because there was something about that early version of democracy that gave them an, adva an advantage, an advantage in, in commerce, in war, in decision making over the other city states because there were times, in particular. Sparta, but others, um, Thebes and others that were of equal size. And Athens just outstripped all of them by uh, many, many times over. And the only distinguishing feature, because they're on this tiny little thing called, we call Greece now, uh, a lot of them, um, was that this notion of democracy gave them, again, to, they became an entrepreneurial country. They had, they, um, uh, they diminish some of the extremes of wealth and poverty, partly because when you have enough economic uh, vitality going on, you have jobs for everybody mm -hmm. and you can pay them more. So they, they built these giant fleets of ships that were way bigger than anybody else's because they had, and it was this, this snowball effect. They had more money coming in. They could, no, everybody had jobs. Everybody got uh, paid good labor and those same people who were um, building the ships were, some of them were also fighting on the ships. So they, their standard of living went up for everybody, even though the citizens who were in charge were, they were not women, they were not slaves, they were not, uh, most of the population was not, were not the citizens, but but everybody benefited from that. And that's why when the when the council and the assembly made these decisions and they would be uh, thousands of people making these decisions, it was accepted by everybody else because in increasingly with the evidence from that was happening, they, they made their lives better too. So it's a real tough call because now where did that, where did those riches come from? It came from exploiting others and conquering other countries. Well, and did those, did the people that they exploited did they, in their exploitation, were were they better off being exploited by the Greeks than by somebody else? I don't. Like, I don't think so. Or, I don't you know, think so particularly. Yeah. Um, as an interesting point about the Persians in a second, but but no, I think they had to pay tribute, significant tribute. And uh -huh. there was this um, there was this entity created uh, called the Delian League that was supposed to be a dem kind of a democratic grouping of multiple oh, city states and. As Athens got more powerful, they took it over and they more and more made it undemocratic, the Delian League itself. And it became there there used to be some neutral place where they kept the treasury of the Delian League, where mm. all the members were supposed to pay in money according to their needs. Well, because of Athens' power, they had the treasury transferred to the Parthenon, and they then had control over how it was used. And they used the money that was supposed to be used for the defense of the countries to build the Parthenon itself and to build lots of other things. So, you know, they did a lot of stuff. But the interesting thing about the Persians is the Persian Empire had nothing called democracy in any way, but they had a whole different philosophy of how they handled conquered territory, and it helped them uh, create such a big empire. And they would conquer a given area, including areas that were very close to Greece, and they would, um, you'd have to pay tribute, but you could keep all your practices that you had in there, you keep your religion, you could keep your decision-making power. They sort of let you do, whether it was democratic or not, I think it was didn't matter to them, but they just realized that if they didn't try to impose their religion and their way of doing things on all their conquered territories, it was a lot easier. And they just would, would um, get tribute. And of course, behind the payment of tribute was the threat of force if they didn't people didn't pay the tribute. So it was some of the colonies probably were happier under the Persians than they were under the Greeks from uh, Athens. Huh. Reminds me of the, have you seen the series, the Medici on Netflix? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you should take a look at that. Cause it's, you know, city states. Yeah. So Florence and Venice and, yeah. and kind of, you know, how, and they had kind of a rudimentary 
democracy because they basically had like town hall meetings or whatever but the you know ruled by the first ruled by the nobles but then as the merchants became more and more powerful or well, then of course it was you know the merchants had to marry into the nobles right. families and then after a while it's like okay who needs the nobles anymore and, right uh, yeah that's what happened in greece too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so I put the links to the books in the chat. So thanks. Books. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I thought, yeah, great presentation, David. Really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, so we've spent a lot of time, the US, that is, exporting, trying to export democracy. Mm -hmm. um, so do you feel that we just haven't paid enough attention to democracy? in the US, you know, in terms of, I mean, we're, we've been imperialistic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you also, another question is, I mean, how do you get, how do you get common definitions of democracy then? Right. Um, if, I mean, I hadn't really thought, you know, when you mentioned that percentage, right? I thought, yeah, there is a threat to democracy. But then when you said, oh, but it's the other side feeling there's a threat. It's like, yeah. what? Wait. Yeah, yeah. There's that's a number of questions in there. Yeah, well, I think that, I think that, I do think that American democracy had the, you could say, I don't know if the luxury is the right word, but had the uh, wherewithal and the ability to further develop its democracy, to eventually give women the vote, things like that, uh, uh, because of being a relatively well off country. Uh, it made it easier. So the, the Greek empire helped the Greeks maintain and develop their democracy. And I think the same with American democracy. Well, didn't Greek democracy, mm. didn't it expand a little bit too? What's that? Didn't, didn't democracy in, Greek, in Greece expand a little, in Athens, expand <clears throat> a little bit too? Well, it expanded only, not geographically, expanded but, only in terms of their representation. The, uh, the safeguards and the policies and procedures and the mechanisms to defend the democracy within Athens. Well, didn't it expand with regard to not just having a representative democracy, but combining representative democracy with a more participatory democracy? Yeah, yeah but, but I'm just saying, but it was always just within Athens, not, other, not another yeah, kind of no. country. Yeah, no, it did. And it was very highly developed and they did a lot of things and one of the impressive things is despite it being a very warlike time and, and there still being an aristocracy there, one of the, and there was some, um, there was a coup that I'm writing about now and there was, uh, and there are a lot of threats and a lot of attempts to take back democracy. There was this, um, this assembly or council, it was called depending on the era, that was um, somehow even the powerful <clears throat> oligarchs had to respect because they had enough tradition behind them, enough of a size. And over and over again, this assembly of many just regular people um, by their votes and by their debates and uh, open debate would basically come down, not on the side of, um, of soaking the rich, which is a big fear of people who start democracies, including our founding fathers. They were worried about that. People were worried about it then. But these, this group, uh, but democracy itself never did that. They never said, we're going to throw out all the rich. We're going to take, they could have. Oh. They had the power to do that. And they didn't do it because I think they realized that, you know, that there were some practical benefits to having uh, people who had resources around and for, but they also protected their own power, but they didn't go too far with it, I guess is my point. Yeah. So, so Mike, to your point, I think the, the, um, the U S particularly driven by experiences of world war II, worked really hard to, to, um, spread democracy and in many ways did a pretty good job, but there were always multiple motives. It wasn't just we want everything to be democratic, but we want to maintain our economic, uh, our economic empire. And so, um, however, um, there was some real utility of that in that it helped a lot of countries. And, and up until the 1990s, I think we had an increasing a number of democracies around the world at that. But then it peaked in like 
I forget when, like the mid nineties and it's been shrinking ever since. So there's more and more authoritarianism, more uh, populism, more nationalism, all that stuff. Things are going the wrong way uh, more recently, but it's still, you know, way better than it was in the past. And, and just like I can say, the Greeks as an empire did a lot of horrible things, way more horrible than our American empire. Um, they also uh, provided the, a body of ideas that allowed, uh, you know, our founding fathers and other people to, to read that stuff. And this just shows the power of ideas to read that stuff from so long ago and say, oh, wow, this is really amazing. And let's adopt it for us. So, so we did a lot of good, I think, in this country, none of it, which is to take away the things we did badly. And that's just gets back to how, like I said earlier, just like people individually are both the children of light and the children of darkness, so are countries, you know, because we're just a collection of people. <laughs> yeah. So countries are the same way. There's no, and this is what I think drives the the uh, the the right and and anybody who wants a simple view of the world crazy, because it's all about gray. It's all about you know nuance there's no easy answer in that it's very complicated and and the the human mind i think wants to have a clear answer this is good that's bad period mm -hmm. don't tell me something is both our minds don't like that just think about your own you don't like that notion but i think our we hopefully know enough now to know that that is the case that we're going to be we're stuck with both and somehow we've got to accept that and do our best to diminish one over the other. You know, to Michael's point, um, and to your point, David, about the early democracy, which was entrepreneurial and had the ability to generate all of uh, these, these jobs, I have a feeling right now, uh, if you look worldwide, the failure of democracy is all about integrating economic um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if you think about after World War II, the generation of my father who went to college on the GI Bill, worked for yeah. IBM, I mean, the, the level of prosperity that we grew up with was unbelievable. Yeah. And that's gone. Right. So democracy, um, it, it kind of gets vacant if all you have are ideas of equality, I mean, I think of the mess in Afghanistan, the idea of women's rights. It it only was it was only resonating when we were there with our money right. uh, because women could work because we provided a lot of jobs for women. Yeah. And so I think um, if you look at what's happening here in this country, part of what we're seeing in the MAGA movement is that disenfranchisement. Right. Democracy is not working for those people that lost industrial jobs as we let those jobs go. So I think um, the early lessons that you're pointing out of the democracies of Greece are really heartfelt. Without economic democracy, uh, ideas are just that. They're just ideas. Right. No, that's right. And there's a, there's a different kind of power in, in a... Uh, decently vital economy let's say that's oh my god that's something that yeah. has consequences for for obviously a roof over everybody's head but also for a feeling of agency as a person to have yeah. um to have economic uh vitality yeah yeah i mean and those... that's where i think you're right things start to slip and fall apart when uh when there's a either a reality or a sense of things not being as good for me as my parents and that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And if you think about Russia right now, the law, I, I mean, the collapse of, of Russia in 91 yeah. Um, yeah. is all about economic collapse. Yeah. So that need to re-experience nationalism in the face of really, a except for oil, uh, a defunct economy is a very hollow promise. I mean, well, and it's why I really think that this notion of uh, political democracy and economic democracy are, are completely linked. And 
And it's why economic democracy is so important, meaning, of course, a revision or a softening, you could say, of capitalism, meaning a uh, yeah. fewer extremes of wealth and power, that kind of thing. That, I mean, I don't worry too much about some imaginary uh, economic democracy. Everybody votes about everything for in every corporation or something. But what, uh, but what can be done is to at least reduce the extremes and at least uh, put some, some, uh, some uh, uh, pull back a little bit what the way capitalism normally works. That's our challenge. And it's not exactly the classical definition of economic democracy, but it's leans in that direction to say, let's at least, let's at least limit some of the stuff. Did you guys see the news item today? I think I saw it. There's a, a movement of leftist um, millionaires or billionaires no. where they that are saying it's such so much more radical than even liberal billionaires of, that exist today. And that is to say the liberal billionaires are the ones who are philanthropists who give a lot of money like George Soros to build democracy directly, things like that. That all seems good. This new group is saying that's not good enough and that's um, elitist in its own right because it's a wealthy person spending their money on things that they care about personally. So this new group is saying, no, tax us more. Take good. our money. Good. Yeah, Take good. most of our money, have it go to the state and the people of that state, of that country, should decide how that money gets used, which is like, you kind of go to yourself, well, duh, of course. But to read that in this article about it being um, such a, it is kind of a revolutionary thing, but that's an example that could, of uh, the sort of uh, feeling of uh, more equality and economic democracy that is being expressed by those people. And there's a, there's a woman highlighted and a young woman in her thirties, I think, who, his family founded several big uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I forget the names, billions and billions of dollars. And she got a big chunk of that. And she's just going at this uh, in a really aggressive way. And it's, it's, and it makes me think of uh, Merrill has a couple high school classmates who for various reasons are incredibly wealthy now. And, and I wouldn't be able to stand this. And it's hard. It's pretty hard for her too. They complain a lot about taxes, they <laughs> a lot about one thing or another, and they have so much money. You think they might be saying, um, "I'm happy to pay my taxes," but yeah. no, it's the reverse yeah. of that. And so, to I'm wanting to send this article. I think it was the New York Times. You may have yeah. seen it, Mike. That was yeah. two of these friends of Merrill's, but I'll, I, that's her job to do that. I'm not gonna. <laughs> well, introduce them to me. I have a really good nonprofit. Uh, but yeah, a lot of them's in California, Mike. So I, I'll do that. It was in the Times yesterday, Suzanne. I'll try and find it for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'd like to I read it. Me too. I mean, I, more enough. It's patriotic been... millionaires has, has been around for a long time, but yeah, know. but this is a different thing. They're okay. they're just saying uh, we we're going to have to we shouldn't decide where our money goes. We're going to just we should just yeah. pay more. Well, to the the same with this other older group, but hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I wanted to say, though, isn't economic democracy considered to be <clears throat> by other people socialist or communist? Right. Yep. And yep. So, sure. But so then how how do we get I think it's both? Well, it, it's both. But I, I'm trying to think of the other side. Well, well I, I think the, well, the, the, ESOPs yeah. has always had a bipartisan support. So, you know. Legislation for worker ownership is one place where both parties seem to agree. They just don't agree on funding it so much. And although now there's springing up some, like Colorado, I think California, there's some states have created centers yeah. to further work, uh, not workplace democracy, but employee ownership. But, but how do you get the MAGA people, you know, the people that attack the capital um, to the point of understanding that so that, you know, they're not attacking what we would call um, democracy. You know, I don't think there's any agreement right now on the role of government. Ah. So I think it takes both. Capitalism can't flourish without government. 
So if you think about the car industry, without roads, there's no car industry. Without electrification, there's no oil industry because right. you've got to electrify the refineries, the lesson of Texas. Yeah. So I think we did, we really got it right before and after World War II because we actually made those investments in the highway system and to give us the car industry. And the, the disagreement right now, the MAGA people think that government investment is, uh, you know, socialism. Right. They're not understanding that capitalism and democracy have to work hand in hand because these investments, I mean, you know, this MAGA congressman who uh, were taking away his freedom because he can't drive an electric car uh, through the state of Virginia, uh, we need investment, obviously, in charging stations if we're going to do this. And that's government. No no private sector company is going to do that uh, well, unless yeah, government think, policy. Yeah. So I think... Well, what goes done. with the what goes with the, uh, the, the, the the that is just this notion of uh, of course the government's bad and of course capitalism in contrast is good and it should be untrammeled and even you know there this is I don't know how widespread this is but a, a young relative of Merrill's who's maybe a young man with a family and is maybe he's twenty eight or something he doesn't make a lot of money has a sales job but his Merrill had a few exchanges with him about this whole business of trying to cross the divide and partisanship in our country it didn't work out. But, <laughs> but his, his view was very explicit. He said, I want there to be a lot of billionaires. I think it's really valuable to me personally because the billionaires invest in the stock market, which makes this, my, the value of my investments go up because the billionaires are, in, and so he's like, bring it on, more billionaires, and I'll get more trickled down to me. And, you know, it's like, where do you even start with that kind of thinking? But he believes that. Yeah. You know, yeah. He just. Well, the, there are studies that you can quote, you know, like the IMF and other studies that show every dollar given to poorer people adds to the economy every dollar given to rich people subtracts from the economy. So, and there aren't really any studies that show trickle down works. Although there was, I guess Laffer had something, but uh, it was dependent on uh, a much narrower divide, a much larger divide, no, I have whatever. Anyway, it, it was much more dependent on a different is income distribution, um, you know, that trickle down works in some very small instances, but not in most cases. So, but Jim, that's a great point. I mean, I, I know about the, those those studies, but do you have any a, a particular version of that that you could send me? Because I'd like to. Yeah. yeah, I quote it all the time, and yeah. And that would be great. So, I mean, I, I I know I've read about that stuff too, but yeah, I have Corey, Corey, Corey Rosen and uh, John Case just wrote a book not long ago on ownership, and I'm sure it's in there. And mm -hmm. but it's also in uh, lots of other books I've got sitting here, like this, moving beyond modern portfolio. This is this is the this is a very narrow book. <laughs> How cool it is, right? right but i have come back to this book more often than any book recently uh because it's basically destroying uh you know two nobel prize winning you know thesis on economics uh, and because you know basically i'm one of the big differences is when modern portfolio is in theory was invented, retail shareholders owned almost everything and institutional shareholders owned about 10%. Wow. And so modern portfolio theory basically said, <clears throat> one thing you, you um, there's no point in trying to influence the market. All you can do is invest in everything because you have no, as an individual, you have no agency <laughs> over right what's right. going on, you know? Well, it's different now when BlackRock owns, you know, $10 billion, $10 trillion 
dollars were not owns, but controls ten trillion dollars in investments, and they do have agency. Yeah, and 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 so uh, anyway, it's a whole. And we have the internet, so even individuals have agency, like GameStop and mm -hmm. all kinds of crazy things. Uh, you can yeah, see. Yeah, I think I think you know that I'm just thinking about what would influence people, and I'm because there's so much suspicion of of uh, and partisanship there's also the idea i think a study like an imf study uh -huh. that would be the best thing i'm thinking about this young man but also merrill's friends and other people i know who complain about government spending for the poor and all of that there's there's something about a um it's not a government study and it's not an individual author's opinion but okay. it's a at least a hopefully reasonably respected in, you know, yeah. international organization, not by everybody, but that would be so if you have a version of that, that would sure, be yeah, but I, it, I mean, it, it also makes a great deal of intuitive sense to me. I mean, yeah, you know, like if somebody gives, gives me a $1,000, um, it's not going to change anything I do, you know, right. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna run out and, you know, do anything. Uh, but if somebody gives other people a thousand dollars will you know they're gonna eat you know they're gonna pay their rent they're gonna you know move right. out of the out from underneath the freeway or whatever right 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 so that goes into the economy and stimulates more you know so it just but what it but what it also fights against is this notion or i guess i'd say myth that there's some reality to it that people who have more have more because they worked harder they were smarter. They were this. There's that. Those people all the time are spouting that stuff. The meritocracy. Yeah, yeah. Notion. And so, uh, if you start to say, "Wait a second, um, that's not the whole story," then I think it's really threatening to them because I think it's really easy. I think there's a huge amount of guilt personally in people who have a huge amount of money, whether they've worked hard or not, inherited or not. Either way, it's it's a complex thing for them, and they. It assuages the guilt by saying, I have this because I worked hard and I was smart, or my grandfather worked hard and he was smart, either way. And it's just, it, it's a hard thing to get around for some people see, because it gets personal. But we see that when, when rights expand and like say women, okay, if women weren't working and now women are working, well, you have 50% more brain power in the economy right. you have right. you know i mean it just makes sense that okay it's you know i but i understand that perspective i remember when i was going to college uh and i was studying to be a teacher uh, you know there's a couple different places i could have taught and one place you know i noticed well geez this high school you know the windows are boarded up there's, you know, and in the same town that i lived in so mm -hmm. you know there's one high school for the rich ki white kids and there was another for the minorities yeah. uh, but the perspective was well, why invest in anything why invest any money they're going to be janitors they're going to be whatever so you know right. these people are going to be dent doctors dentists engineers that's yeah. where you need to put the money because that's what's going to drive the economy you know but if you put mo the money more equally the economy would grow even faster because there are people over there that can be dentists and engineers and all that. So, yeah, yeah but it amazes me how how sort of corrupting and uh, wealth is. You know, there's just again these these few friends of Merrill's that I know they and you, they get talking about it and they just get they seem so angry and bitter That's awful. about taxes and it's not again when you have. I don't know, however many, many, many millions of dollars, you, you, why are you bitter about paying taxes? Well, but they I, don't have to pay any taxes. I mean, well, basically, you know, you've got trust funds, you've got, you know, you've well, got you so certainly many vehicles that I don't see, uh, you know, what are they paying sales tax? I mean, you know. but, I, but I think this thing this sort of, but that's why I think it's a, it's an irrational psychological defense against feeling like they do I really deserve to have all this stuff oh yes I do because I worked hard there and there's also a little bit of anti-government stuff that kind of filters into that too yeah yeah I, I, 
Interesting. Unfortunately, I've got to run, but this has been great. David, thank you so much. I really appreciate well, this it. This is not exactly a small topic. We could go on, we and, go on. and on. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, everybody next month. Doing it. This is the, we, 